All right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my talk. Uh, this is one of my uh, personal gripes. I'm very passionate about this issue. Um, it is a general misconception, in my opinion, that uh, computer science is mathematics of, or mathematics. Or I, it's, it's quite ironic that I'm doing a talk about mathematics, even though I have a very difficult time saying the word. Um, but I'm going to argue why computer science uh, is not related to mathematics or why mathematics is not fundamental to computer science and why it actually hurts us by acting as if it is. Um, first of all, so who am I? Why should you listen to my opinion? Um, I'm Merlijn Seebrechts. Uh, I have a PhD in computer science. Uh, I'm currently a researcher at IMEC and I teach at Ghent University. Um, I'm also unrelated, uh, part of the Ubuntu Community Council and part of the Snapcrafter score team. But all this to say I have some experience in computer science and coding and things like that. And so uh, I am a certified computer science expert. And in order to show this well, I'm using a very professional font Comic Sans. So, I did a 190-page PhD thesis about computer science. Just give a guess for how many mathematical formulas were in this PhD thesis that I successfully defended. Depends on the thesis. My thesis, specifically. The subject is service orchestration from cloud to edge, using collaborative compositions. Maybe three. 32. 332, somebody else? I'm guessing zero since this is your talk. The answer is indeed zero. Uh, I was able to successfully defend a PhD thesis with zero mathematical formulas and they were totally not needed in my thesis. Um, but if you ask Google, does computer science require maths? Then Google says yes, computer science operates on the language of mathematics. So if anyone is interested in becoming a programmer and they're bad at mathematics, they are dissuaded from going into the field of computer science. Um, yes? Sorry, can I ask a question? How are you defining mathematics? It will become more clear throughout oh, okay. the presentation, <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, then it's also the question, should I pursue computer science if I'm bad at mathematics? And then they say, uh, no, you should not pursue computer science if you're bad at math. So uh, I, was, I, I was thinking, where else can I get uh, some information about this? So I asked ChatGPT. ChatGPT is computer science mathematics. And it says, while math mathematics provides the foundation for much of computer science, uh, uh, computer science itself has also contributed new mathematical ideas. So it's, it's completely convinced that computer science is mathematics. And then I ask it, okay, what are the most important tasks of a software developer? Well, they're requirement scattering, design, implementation, testing, and maintenance. So obviously I ask which one of these actually requires mathematics. And it says, well, actually only implementation and testing requires it. And specifically, you need to perform calculations if you manipulate data. And you need statistical analysis in order to figure out, for example, how quickly your application is running. Well, in, in my opinion, this, this answer is quite true, but it also hints at that mathematics is not actually foundational to computer science because you only need it to analyze data, but like, like, yeah, obviously you need mathematics to analyze data and you also need it if the program that you create is, is calculating things. Well, yeah, you need mathematics if your program does calculations, obviously. Um, I'm not the only person with this opinion. Um, this person uh, says, don't ruin programming m with math. Uh, he is a certified smart boy. Um, he is a uh, uh, person who has dedicated his life to uh, teaching computer science to uh, peoples at, for example, John Hopkins University, which is a quite prestigious uh, American university, and on Cos Coursera, which is not so prestigious, but very 
used a lot, uh, and so he is certified smart boy and certified educator. And his argument is that, uh, sure, at the core of every computer is math, but really complex math, he says even. But that statement is about as useful as telling a student driver that at the core of every car is an internal combustion engine. Surely, when, 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 when we, we teach people how to drive a car, we don't start by explaining them how an internal combustion engine works, and we don't require them to know a lot about uh, the mechanics of an engine. Uh, and so if you would do it like that, if once you have to get your driver's license, they, they would give you a, a full lecture on how a car actually works inside of it, uh, most people would say, I'm clearly too stupid to drive because they're not interested in actual combustion en engines, they're interested in uh, driving. And this is the exact thing that happens with a lot of people who want to get into computer science. They find the uh, 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 introductory computer science uh, 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 exercises and they see that a lot of these exercises for some reason require you to solve mathematical challenges using programming languages. And so you learn the programming language by solving mathematical challenges using the programming language. Um, and they say, oh, well, I'm bad at mathematics, so I'm clearly too stupid to program. This is an issue. This is an issue also from a purely educational point of view, because you're mixing two separate subjects into one. So it's during, in education theory, it's always best to have a single subject and in each course have a single thing that is taught so that the course can focus on that and so that the student can learn this single thing without requiring to learn something else. Um, However, if you use mathematics in order to teach computer science, then you're mixing two subjects into one, making it, even for people who are good at mathematics, making it more difficult to actually learn how to program. So, um, at its core, he says, programming consists of two things, syntax and logical constructs. Um, by syntax, he means like where to place a comma how to place the words, which words to place in front of the other. And logical constructs are things like an if or a for loop, things that you use to make your code um, behave differently depending on input. Or if you are programming a robot, if the robot bounces up against a wall, then it should turn and go further. That's, those are the logical constructs of programming language. So then the obvious question is, can you teach these logical constructs? Can you teach logic without mathematics? Um, well, we have to imagine that there would be something that would be riddled with logic, where logic would be the main way to interact with it, but that's not mathematics. Um, if only there was something like that, where you can teach logic without actually teaching mathematics. Well, just, just fucking teach them to program. Because code has logic, and you can just teach the logic of programming by teaching them to program without actually having to teach them mathematics. And there are very good ways to actually even teach the logic of programming to children without having to teach them the syntax of programming. And that's Scratch, for example. Scratch is a great way to start to introduce uh, children to how programming actually works, how the logic of programming actually works, um, without having to think of syntax, because the visual representation makes sure that it's clear what you ca can and can't do in your code. Um, and there's no mathematics involved in it. But then the question comes, isn't logic math? What you ask, what do you actually mean with mathematics? Um, formal logic was actually created in a bunch of places independent from each other. For example, in India, um, it was mainly started as a way to uh, introspect language itself 
um, Sanskrit grammar. Um, Sanskrit grammar rules were one of the first introduction of, of, of logic in India and the formal study of logic in India 500, 5,000 years uh, before uh, some, uh, uh, some person uh, was born. Um, it formed the foundation for logic study in the Indian school of logic. Uh, in China, you had the Mohist school. It dealt with issues relating to valid inference, like if, then, and conditions of correct conclusions. Same with ancient Greek. Aristotelian logic was logic created by a philosopher um, and is right now the basis for modern day Western logic. It's been refined a lot by uh, Christian and Muslim philosophers. Um, and so the facts to gain from this is that modern Western logic was created by philosophers, not by mathematicians. Philosophy today still plays a central role in the study of logic. Phil people who do a PhD in philosophy are often studying logic and studying how to get to truths from observations. Um, mathematics is just simply one single formal way to describe and use logic. And it's a very useful way to describe and use logic. It's a, for people who are good in mathematics, um, it's a very useful way to make further conclusions from uh, 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 logic, from uh, data points. Um, however, it's just a single formal way to describe and use logic. Mathematics did not create logic. It's more the case that we, we created mathematics in order to have a different tool in order to do reasoning. So, yes. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not saying numbers don't exist in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. If, 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 if you want to go as far as does anybody need to know what numbers are in order to program? Yeah, sure. People need to know what numbers are in order to program. People also need to know what numbers are in order to interact with the world. People need to know what numbers are in order to uh, pay for something. But people don't say, oh, you, you can't be a cashier in, unless you're very good at mathematics. So philosophy in programming. Um, some facts. The Linux kernel has 8 million lines of code. Nobody can hold this in their head. As a result, writing significant big programs like the Linux kernel is all about making enormous amounts of information easily understandable. And we have a whole bunch of really interesting tools to do that. Um, there's this great comic about why you shouldn't interrupt a programmer. The reason why you shouldn't interrupt a programmer is because during programming, they're reading something and then building in their head an entire model of how the program works. They're basically relearning a certain tiny part of the program in order to figure out what is going wrong and in order to figure out what they have to change in order to make it right, for example. And then once you interrupt them, this whole mental model that is in their head breaks down and they have to start from scratch. This is basically the day job of a programmer. Um, this this slide should be gone. <laughs> so a Linux kernel has 8 million lines of code. Nobody can hold that in their head. So we need a way in order to better hold information in our head. The way that we do this is by actually hiding the information behind abstractions. Um, for, as an example, if in an app you download a certain podcast, for example, this application itself, the programmer of this application itself, is using an abstraction in order to download that file. Because downloading a file requires like very complex steps in order to contact the internet. First of all, they have to get an IP address 
from the host name. Um, they have to uh, con uh, start a TCP IP handshake in order to connect with the server where the file is located. They use SSL for encryption, they use X509 for authentication, they use other protocols in order to actually download the file. But people who are making an Android app where you can just listen to podcasts, they have no idea how all this stuff works and still they can create programs that download files. This is because we have the concept of an abstraction, a library like CURL, which has been created by somebody who is an expert in how to download files and does all these things in the background. And the interface to that library is simply download this, uh, download this URL. And so this means that the person creating the app that, that, for example, lets you listen to podcasts, the person who creates that app doesn't have to think about those hundreds of thousands of lines of code that are used in order to create a file, because those are all hidden behind an abstraction. And this is a fundamental concept in computer science, in creating programs, a whole bunch of the day job of developers consists of creating new abstractions in order to hide certain parts of the code so that they, on a general level, can still understand how their software works. And these abstractions are stackable. For uh, the SSL encryption, for example, there is actually another library that specializes in encryption. And so the CURL library uses another library for encryption. And this is its abstractions all the way down. Um, and then we go and look at what is the origin of abstraction. Um, abstraction is something that biologists believe that it developed in humans, the, the, the possibility to abstract things it developed in humans 50,000 to 100,000 years ago. And they say it is very closely related to the development of language. And this is obviously obvious, because if you call something an apple, and you call something else an apple, every single apple is different from every other apple. You can't find a single apple in this world that has the exact same atoms in the exact same configuration as other apples. Um, so in order to be able to call something an apple, you have to hide a whole bunch of properties from that thing in order to be able to categorize it into a category where it can be compared to other things. Greek philosophers like uh, these people, I won't try to pronounce their names, um, they, they uh, created the first formal study of abstractions, uh, for example, saying that everything comes from water. Every single thing that we see in this world is built from water. Now, science has disproved this. Um, I'm not sure if you heard, but not everything comes from water in this world. Um, but this idea evolved, uh, was evolved by philosophers throughout the ages. For example, Francis Bacon evolved this idea into induction, where it actually started talking about um, um, objects. And so an example of philosophy that is used in programming is the idea of object-oriented programming. It's based on this idea of objects uh, first created by, uh, uh, well, first talked about by Aristotle's metaphysics with different words. Uh, everything has potency, and that is the idea of what it can become. Everything has an act, and that it is what it is. Potency is basically the class, like it is an apple, and then the act is it is like a red apple with this specific configuration of atoms. And then Charles S. Pierce defined object as anything we can think and talk about. Um, and an object is defined by its properties and its relations. And so if anyone here is interested in object-oriented programming, this resembles very much the ideas of object-oriented programming, where you have classes and where an object contains values and functions, things to interact with something else. And so a very fundamental aspect of modern programming actually has its history in philosophy. So, Status. Um, the idea of math is a fundamental aspect of programming. 
is busted. Math is not a fundamental aspect of programming. Philosophy is a fundamental aspect of programming. Because, yes? Point out that mathematics is just a language that we talk about philosophy. That, that's what sure. it is. Yeah, sure. That's, that's a very good ob observation. I've yeah. studied mathematics for years, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, the second idea is that math is a fundamental aspect of logic. As you say, no, it is not. But philosophy is a fundamental aspect of logic. Then the last one is math is a good way to teach people programming. Well, we also busted this myth. Math is not a good way to teach people programming. It's better to only focus on the programming and the logic of the programming instead of also drag maths into this. Um, whether or not philosophy is a good way to teach programming, um, I don't think it is for the exact same reason. Just focus on the actual thing you need to program. Don't go dragging another field into this. The main thesis of the first part of my presentation is this. Don't ruin programming with mathematics. We will get a lot more people interested in programming and we will able to, to actually teach programming to a lot more people who are interested in programming if we simply do away with the mathematics and if we do away with the idea that in order to be a good programmer you also have to be a good mathematician and that if people in uh, 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 secondary school, for example, are really interested in computers and are really bad at mathematics, then we shouldn't dissuade them from going into computer science because actually uh, computer science is about much more than mathematics. Um, then the second question is, is math really a fundamental aspect of computer science? Um, the person who created the blog post that I refer to it uh, He's choosing his battles. He's saying, sure, at the core of every computer is math, really complex math. Um, however, you have to know something about me. So I started my PhD in August 2015. I graduated in November 2022. I did more than seven years over a PhD, which normally takes three to four years. Um, I am not someone who quits. I am way too stubborn to quit. I am way too stubborn to actually choose my battles. So I will try to convince you that the idea that um, at the core of every computer is mathematics, I will try to persuade you that this is also not true. Um, let's look at what is at the core of every computer and let's look at it from a very technical viewpoint. Um, software is at the core of every computer and the most fundamental low-level aspects of software are kernels, drivers and assembly code. I will explain a bit more about what that is. But we also have hardware at the core of every computer. That's a CPU, a GPU, memory and other physical things. So, um, um, the first question then is, is maths a fundamental aspect of a kernel? If we ask ChatGPT what are uh, fundamental aspects of a kernel, uh, then it talks about, uh, and, and if you ask ChatGPT what, what, uh, what competences does somebody need to have in order to program a kernel, it says, well, you have to know about operating systems, about computer architecture, about systems programming, about algorithms and data structures, debugging and performance optimization and security. And here again, maybe two of them are slightly related to mathematics, algorithms and data structures, and debugging and performance optimization. But still, still then, let's look at the actual Linux kernel. This is a very old diagram. Right now, the Linux kernel is even more complex than that. But this is a, a, a very old diagram that explains the structure of the Linux kernel. So let's look at everything in the kernel that's related to storage. This is everything that's related to storage. First of all, we have something in the kernel that creates the concept, the abstraction of a file. So that the program can open a file, it doesn't have to think about uh, spin that disk in 
that RPM and get those bits from that disk. It just says to the kernel, open that file. And then the kernel translates that to lower level concepts such as a virtual file system, which is translated to even lower level con concepts such as page caches, such as uh, protocols for network file systems or um, encoding formats for physical file systems, such as extended to then that is even translated to even more low-level concepts such as block devices and drivers. And then finally, that is the thing that actually connects to the hardware. So this is basically abstractions all the way. The most important part of developing the Linux kernel is understanding these incredibly low-level abstractions that on the one side are tuned to concepts that make it easier for developers and users of the system to actually use files and things like that. And then the other side of the abstraction is things to actually control the hardware. Um, second question is, we, we talked about drivers, another fundamental aspect of computer systems. Is math a fundamental aspect of a driver? Here you see part of the code of, in Linux, the driver for USB mouse, mice, for USB mice. Um, and what it actually does is it puts a whole bunch of bits, which are flags, something that's on or off. It puts a whole bunch of bits in a whole bunch of registries in order to, for example, look at, uh, is the LED of the mice on, of the mouse on? If it's not on, then turn it on by switching this bit. Um, does the mouse have, uh, is the mouse moving at the moment? If the mouse is moving at the moment, then a certain flag is on. And so all this code, all it does is interact with hardware by changing bits in memory. And then in order to know which bits to change in the memory, you have to read through the data sheets of the hardware that you are developing. Um, again, you are working with numbers. Yes, you have to know what numbers are. You have to have a very, very basic understanding of mathematics. But is this mathematics? Is this something that a person who is bad at mathematics, uh, when they are 18, who doesn't understand how derivatives work or how integrals work, is this something that that kind of person wouldn't be able to do? No, definitely not. You have a whole bunch of Linux kernel programmers who are really bad at algebra, for example, but are very good at this kind of thing, reading through data sheets, figuring out which bits to set, figuring out how to communicate with the hardware. Um, then lastly, we have the lowest level of software is assembly. Assembly language is basically a programming language that is directly executed by the CPU. So every single program that is running on your system eventually gets translated into assembly instructions and then the CPU reads those instructions and does the, 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 the things that uh, those instructions ask it to do. And those instructions typically are things like load data from memory, do something with that data and then store it back into memory. Um, that's basically what assembly is. Um, it is simply another programming language, but that's very, very low level. And here you see an example of uh, an assembly page for, um, I think this might actually be one of the first programs written in assembly in the, in the 1950s. Uh, assembly was created first for, uh, to create calculators. Um, Assembly was first created uh, uh, in order to program calculators. And so assembly itself, it's not mathematics. But you can use assembly in order to do mathematics. Because that what is what it was originally created for. It was originally created in order to write a calculator, program a calculator. So. The elephant in the room. Some people might have constantly been thinking during this presentation, yeah, but all computers are Turing machines. And Turing machines are mathematical machines. 
Um, so let's talk a bit about Turing machines. But I think you can't talk about Turing machines without talking about the tragic life of Alan Turing. He's a British mathematician and computer scientist uh, who cracked the Enigma machine, which is uh, an encrypted communication machine used by Germany during World War II. World War II. Um, and he uh, 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 is credited with helping the, 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 the Normandy invasion and things like that a lot um, um, by, uh, for example, knowing where submarines are uh, because they were able to intercept communication of uh, uh, German troops. Um, he also created the foundations of modern mathematical computer theory. Um, he then was injected with estrogen uh, over the course of a year in order to accomplish chemical castration because they figured out that he was gay. He was then stripped of his security clearance and uh, committed suicide two years later at the age of uh, 41. Um, this was the, the thank you that he got from the British government for all his uh, 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 influence in both the field of computer science and his influence in uh, winning World War II. Um, only in the year of 2012, so that's 11 years ago, was he posthumously, uh, uh, was he pardoned, uh, uh, was he officially pardoned by uh, the British government. Um, this is a complete uh, tragedy. However, let's talk a bit about uh, his contributions to mathematical computer theory. Turing machines. A Turing machine is basically a mathematical model of computation that describes an abstract machine that manipulates symbols on a strip of tape according to a table of rules. Here you see um, um, a physical representation of what this uh, mathematical machine would look like. Um, this mathematical model, you can basically see it as a way to um, simulate what a computer does to simulate it in uh, uh, using uh, mathematical functions so that you can then use these functions in order to prove certain things. One of the things he was able to prove with this mathematical model was that um, um, the halting problem. Uh, it was a question for a long time whether or not it would be able to, you would be able to create a piece of software that analyzed a second piece of software and told you whether or not that second piece of software would ever stop running. So if you start a program and the program just has a loop uh, uh, forever, just print this line of text, that program will never halt. Um, he used uh, this mathematical model in order to show that it's impossible to create a single program that can check any other program and say that it halts say whether or not it holds. Um, so what's very important here is that even though the theory of Turing machines is often used to refer to modern computers, this is actually something that was created after modern computers existed. It was something that was created in order to perform a certain job and the job specifically was reason about certain aspects of computer science. Um, it's a mathematical tool to analyze how computers could work um, and it is in some ways equivalent to modern computers at a certain theoretical slash mathematical level and because of that we can make some uh, uh, predictions about modern computers using it. However, it is different enough to cause big issues in modern computers. And in order to understand that, uh, I need to talk a bit about how computers work. Um, the first issue is that a Turing machine is basically single core. You have one execution unit, you have one CPU with one core that executes instructions the one after the other. There's no way to run multiple programs next to each other. However, modern computers run multiple programs next to each other and run them on multiple cores. Um, the whole point of machine learning, the whole point of why we see such a surge in machine learning is because these, are, these GPUs are specific processing units that, can, that sometimes have 100 to 1000 cores and can run all this in 
parallel. However, you can't really use the Turing machine model in order to reason about GPUs and even about modern GPUs that are multi-core. Um, this is part of a research paper in, created in 2015. In 2015, they said there's still uh, computer science is still lacking a solid yet intuitive parallel Turing machine model. And because of that, there's a whole bunch of things that we would like to verify about modern computers that we can't. Um, the, the, another thing to know about computers is that single threaded performance. So how quickly a computer can calculate things, can execute instructions. It has been stagnant for the past 10 years. Um, since about 2010, the single threaded performance of computers has not really changed significantly. Um, because of that, even though the single threaded performance has plateaued basically, computers have still become a lot quicker and, and a lot more performant. And we have done this by simply switching up the CPU so that they have multiple cores that they can do a whole bunch of things at the same time. And in that sense, like after a second, a modern CPU still calculates a hundred times more instructions than an old CPU, simply because it has much more cores than old CPUs. So the second, yes. I think it's gone slower because now we've turned off hyper-threading because of I will talk a little bit about that uh, later in this presentation. Uh, um, and so the, the thing is that developers still write programs as if they are instructions that are executed by a single CPU sequentially, even though that's totally not the case anymore. So the second issue is that modern CPUs are constantly lying to the software that's running on top of it. Um, so, to give an example of this line, um, sequential programs are uh, uh, actually executed in parallel. So a sequential program is first do this, then do that, then do that. For example, you could have a program that checks first, check if the password is correct. If the password is correct, then give this user access to that file. Um, those are sequential instructions that have to be executed in that specific order. However, how modern CPUs work is that they don't execute uh, an instruction in a single click. They execute instructions in a pipeline. In order to execute a single instruction, you have to have at least seven steps, at least seven clock steps of the CPU in order to uh, execute a single instruction. Um, so if you have a single instruction, check the password, then only seven clock times later will you have the result of whether or not the password matches. Um, so this means that uh, the CPU itself, it doesn't actually wait seven steps in order to start processing the next instruction. Because from the moment the first instruction is in the second step, it can put the second instruction in the first step. And so it steps like that and it, it continues and it goes on. And so actually, even if the, if, the, if the first step is check the password, then the CPU, it basically, um, 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 it tries to predict whether or not the password is correct and then loads one of the um, uh, pieces of code that are, should be executed after either the password is correct or the password is incorrect. So let's say the CPU predicts that uh, the password will be correct. Then it loads, it already loads the instruction in order to show the file to the user. And then only once, only at this point, at this point, the, the, the instruction that checks the password, only at this point is it finished. And then the CPU sees, oh, the password is actually incorrect. So then it has to clear all these things that it was already executing and it has to roll back to uh, instruction number two and execute another instruction number two, the thing that gets executed when, when the password is incorrect. And so this, we call this speculative execution. However, uh, as Christophe said, speculative execution is a big issue for security, as we recently found out. Um, and as a result, 
computers, uh, I think it was around 2018, um, all computers um, became a lot slower because we suddenly figured out that it's not good to do this, the speculative execution with authorization code, for example. And so one of the things that CPUs now do is turn off a certain kind of multi-threading. And another thing that programs do is put a whole bunch of garbage instructions after every security check so that even if the CPU predicts the wrong branch, the only thing that's, in, that's being calculated by the CPU are garbage instructions and not the actual instructions that would show the user the file, for example. Um, so, this is an issue. It's an issue that the, the foundation of uh, 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 modern programs still uses this sequential approach. So what are the alternatives? One of the alternatives is the actor model. It was actually proposed in uh, 1973. However, um, it was not widely adopted at that point because everybody, by at that time, uh, every single year the CPU still became faster and people were even publishing articles that multi -pros, um, and parallel processing is simply dead and will never be usable, will never be uh, useful. However, in recent years, because the underlying CPUs now are doing everything in parallel, in recent years this idea has become a lot more popular on a lot of different levels of the stack. So now you have programming languages who implement the actor model on top of this sequential CPU code because this allows them to run programs on multiple different servers at the same time. However, there's also people looking into why can't we just use this as the foundational model for how programs are executed on a CPU, which completely works in uh, which, which has, like, a, this model has parallel processing in its DNA, basically. So why don't we use this as the lowest level of abstraction? Why don't we create a new assembly language that is created in order to run parallel? And that's basically what CUDA is. CUDA is um, running a, a piece of software on top of the GPU. CUDA is used a lot in machine learning. Uh, CUDA is one of the reasons why these modern machine learning models like ChatGPT are so good because all this legacy baggage of single threaded sequential programs was just done away with. Write programs specifically for CPUs that have thousands of cores um, and suddenly we can do a whole bunch of things a lot faster and a lot more uh, secure. Um, that's basically my presentation. Uh, we still have 15 minutes for uh, questions, so uh, let's hear them. So, in a sense, yes. In a sense, if you, lo if you look at functional programming, for example, a lot of the abstractions that are used in functional programming are things that actually come from mathematics. While if you look at object-oriented programming, the abstractions themselves are completely removed from mathematics. And so in that sense, depending on which programming language you use, um, the concepts that you will see will be closer or further related to mathematics. However, in my opinion, um, JavaScript is a functional language, but JavaScript is one of the easiest languages to teach to people. Um, so even people who know nothing about mathematics, so even in that case, I think it still doesn't make any sense to teach the mathematics behind it. Just teach them the logic of the language. Homo 
logic isn't taught in mathematics education until you are quite high up already. So you need to have already got to the point where you're studying linear algebra and differential equations before logic is actually introduced because those are the mathematical methods of essentially what programming languages are designed to do. You look at a system, you identify the variables, you figure out how they interact with each other, and yeah. formalize it. That's yeah. what you're doing when you're yeah. programming. They don't yeah. bother teaching that until yeah. you're quite high up. So I, I agree with that statement. However, if you look at a lot of bachelors in computer science, they don't actually teach you formal logic. They teach you a lot of mathematics, like graph theory, uh, uh, like, like matrix calculations, but they don't actually teach you formal logic. Well, that's formal, formal. I, I only got formal logic after I was already a quite good programmer when I studied uh, a, a master's in computer science. And then at the end of the, the, the bachelor's part of that study, did they teach us uh, formal logic? And so one, uh, another reason why they always say that um, uh, you have to be good in mathematics in order to learn programming is because still to this day, a lot of introductory programming classes um, are the, the, the exercises there. You, you just you, you have to solve mathematical equations. You have to solve mathematical exercises using a programming language. And so in reality, it is difficult. It is really difficult to get started with computer science in the official university system if you're bad at mathematics. But this isn't something inherent to computer science. This is something inherent to this, um, um, to this myth, basically, that in order to be a good computer scientist, you have to be a good mathematician. Yeah. Really easy to teach to people yeah. who don't have strong arithmetic skills. Yeah. I, I think I maybe know where this, this myth might come from because many years ago when personal computers were not readily readily available, the used the kind of people that at schools you used to see using having access to computers were physicists, were yes. mathematicians in order to do complex computation like Fortran or whatever and those kind of things and Maybe I'm wondering if that's where that myth comes from, that yeah. goal, because you need to, only the physics teachers or something like that, they have the access, they, you need to have their same qualifications. Yeah. Well, it, it, it even goes further than that. If you look at the history of assembly language, for example, mm -hmm. it was specifically created in order to create a calculator. And even before that, if you look at the, the late 1800s, the beginning of the, of the 20th century, um, why were they creating computers? They were creating computers to do um, um, calculations of, basically physics calculations of the moon in order to predict the tides. Very, very mathematical things. And so even from the, the first moment computer science became computer science, in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, it was driven by mathematicians who wanted to create computers to do complex calculations easier. Like if, if for, for me, an example, like uh, I, I love math, but math doesn't like me. <laughs> I've always been way better at languages, and I've, uh, I've always seen as um, programming as uh, uh, like the art of explaining to a computer what to do. So that there's this, this, it's more of a language thing. Uh, than actually knowing math, but knowing, having knowledge of math, I think as a programmer helps you to achieve very specific things because it, fundamentally programming is essentially mainly manipulating data, manipulating information. I have this input in this format, how do I translate this or manipulate it to have the outcome that I want, for example. And Sure, you can have math to help you to accomplish certain things, like for example, uh, game development. If you don't yeah. know, if you don't know the formulas, how to calculate uh, the gravity or something like that, you get a very buggy game. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, mathematics is incredibly useful in computer science for certain types of programming, like physics computing, like graphics and things like that. Yeah. I, 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 I would, 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 would give this, this distinction. Um, you have top computer scientists who, are, who don't use mathematics in their day job at all. You don't have top physicists. You will probably be able to agree that do in their day job don't use mathemat mathematics at all. I, I will say that you use explaining the, something abstract and using math as a language to describe reality and possibly also predict outcomes. So it's I'm like, going to be explaining a lot of that, so <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> but to optimize the program, uh, shorter name will be uh, um, the, uh, the, the, so the, this, the, the speed of Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is what ChatGPT also says. Although I would actually also challenge that idea. The main way to speed up programs is to, for example, do a trace and look at why certain things take so long, and then find the logical errors for for the one side. Find the logical errors that cause you to do more calculations than are actually needed. And this, this tracing stuff, this is, you need a lot of computer science knowledge in order to do this tracing and debugging, but it's often very low level computer science knowledge about um, bytecode, for example, about assembly, and not really mathematical knowledge. Like maybe you can do some statistical inference um, and, and this, this is also useful, but you can definitely improve the performance of a program considerably um, without having any mathematical background. So, so the, the first question, um, I would say that mathematics is, is, is one type of abstraction, basically. I, I wouldn't say that abstractions come from mathematics. I would say that mathematics come from abstractions. And if you look at the history of mathematics, this is basically it. At a certain point, philosophers were having a really hard time doing certain scientific things. They needed a new abstraction. Uh, much more abstract, much more disconnected from reality, so they created mathematics. Um, and then the second question you said is, do computer scientists use a lot of mathematical thinking? I would say mainly that they use logical thinking. And there is still a very large difference between logical thinking and mathematical thinking. Uh, 
addition is more logical. Yes, it is than, than mathematics. So it, it, addition, in a sense, can very well be part of logical thinking without having to need mathematics, because adding certain amounts together is something that we did as humanity and that we were able to wrap our head around before we actually created mathematics. An engineer uh, said one time, uh, 10 years ago, uh, everything is an addition in computer science. <laughs> yeah, and, and like, like in, in a sense, it's, it's true. Like, but if, if you, I, I think what one of my big inspirations is Ada Lovelace. Uh, she's, they, they call her the first programmer. And hmm? she, she, yeah, yes, she's a very famous mathematician. Um, and um, what she did was um, somebody that she worked with created a mathematical engine. Uh, a, a physical machine that could do calculations. And so what she did was make the leap to the idea that this machine, even though internally it was manipulating numbers, these numbers could actually not be numbers but could represent music. They could represent the real world. They could re represent everything. And so in, in my opinion, in a sense, computers saying that computers function by addition, yes, it's true that computers function by addition, but computers are also, these things that they add, they have meaning. And this meaning is, is, is real. And this meaning is, is much more than the, the, the numeric meaning, because otherwise, like an, a, number, a number can't record me. A number can't drive a robot. Uh, uh, because these numbers have a completely different meaning, I would say that it's, it, it's, it's not true anymore that at the core is mathematics. With that bombshell, maybe say thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you.